Thanks for staying up later. I'm Linda Ellerby, sitting in for Bob Costas. And if I say to you, bandana, blue jeans, sneakers, and a beard, sounds like any country and western singer, right? No, but it sounds like Willie Nelson. Back again for the second night. And Willie, tonight we are going to talk about your problems with the IRS, the 16 million and change they claim you owe, and the IRS tapes, the album that you hope is going to help you pay it off. But I got to say, it is a long way uh, from where you started. Yeah, it is, come to think of it. When you were starting out, before you really were able to support yourself as a musician, you worked as a radio disc jockey, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Do you like that kind of work? Oh, yeah, yeah. I may do that again one of these days when I decide to hang it up and just sit around and do nothing or I'll sit around and play records at some, disc at some radio station somewhere. I started out uh, at a station in, in uh, Texas, in Hillsborough, called KHBR in Hillsborough, and I went down to KBOP in Pleasanton, and then uh, I had really enjoyed playing records. You had a, a sign-off you used, I believe? A sign-on. Sign-on, oh, and yeah. it was? I said, this is your old cotton-picking, snuff-dipping, tobacco-chewing, stump-jumping, gravy-sopping, coffee-pot-dodging, dumpling-eating, frog-gigging hillbilly from Hill County. Well, it's descriptive. <laughs> I'm real glad you can sing. <laughs> <laughs> the music was better. <laughs> you know, actually, there have been people along the way that have told you you can't sing. Oh, I've heard that before, yeah. Uh, a couple of times. A lot of people didn't think that I really sang on meter or they, uh, I talked my songs. Early in my career, I guess I did a little different style. I didn't really sing as much as I was sort of talking and singing to, at the same time. I don't think anybody has said that, though, since 1978 when you cut the Stardust album, which was a, a major breakthrough, I think. In, in many, many ways. Tell, tell me about how that album came to be. Well, I had all, uh, always wanted to do songs like Stardust and uh, in a session and record them, but uh, honestly, I wasn't qualified to write the arrangements. I wasn't qualified to sit down and teach a group of musicians how to play these songs correctly. Harbor Lads, Moonlight in Vermont, all these are very uh, uh, complicated chords, arrangements, etc. So I knew I wanted to do the songs, but I knew that I wasn't qualified to do them. So I had to wait until I found someone that I felt comfortable enough to go in the studio and turn everything over to him. And uh, Booker T uh, was the guy that I finally uh, ran into that I said, yeah, Booker T, uh, you can do it. Uh, Booker T and the MGs, you remember Booker T sure. from the early days? So it just so happened that I moved into an apartment house in L.A. right uh, n underneath his apartment. So we became acquainted and uh, hung out together and started talking about doing this album. And uh, uh, it was uh, one of the best moves I ever made, I think. How did you choose which songs to do on that album? I wrote down my favorite songs. I started out with Stardust. Moonlight in Vermont, which is my two favorite songs in Georgia. All, uh, someone to watch uh, over yeah, me. Uh, someone to watch over me. Blue skies. Uh, sunny side of the sunny street. Sunny side of the street. And I know this just, album. Just wrote down the first <laughs> ten songs that come off the top of my head, and I handed them to Booker T. and he said, "Yeah, I'll write the arrangements," and uh, he did some excellent arrangements. You also have done a good deal of movie acting. Uh, and I've enjoyed it, but do you always play Willie Nelson or some version of Willie Nelson in these movies? He's the only guy I'm sure of. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever I'm playing, uh, this guy becomes me. Was, was your first role in a movie in Electric Horseman? Was right, that, yeah. How did that happen? How did you come to be in that movie? I was at a party in Nashville one night with, uh, uh, over at Billy Sherrill's house, and uh, Robert Redford was there, and he was trying to... Uh, talk some people into doing some shows for his environmental project that he was in. And uh, we flew back to L.A. the next day on the same plane together, and we were talking about movies, and he said, well, if anything ever comes up, I'll, you know, I'll call you if you want to be in the movies. And I said, well, sure. So he did. Uh, he came through. Is it true that you ad-libbed what 
what is probably the best line in the movie, and certainly the line that everybody remembers. Yeah, Sidney wanted uh, something to be said at that particular spot, and the writers didn't have anything really that they had come up with. So uh, he said, you know, have you got any ideas of what you would say? And so I had no idea that they would use it. It was more or less as a joke, uh, because it was an old joke that I had picked up in Abbott years ago. <laughs> And so I uh, said those lines, and uh, everybody laughed and said, yeah, I used to use that one. You have a kind of a, an interesting philosophy about drugs. Do you not? I don't know. What is it, I wonder? Well, I know in your book, uh, you write about your feelings about marijuana. And, and I th correct me if I'm wrong, I think you separate grass from other drugs in your mind. Yeah. Grass is an herb. Uh, grows out of the ground. It's a flower. It's not a drug. I think in the book you said, uh, if I do grass every day, I don't get a headache. Is that it? Or if I smoke grass every day, I don't get a headache. Is that correct? No, the, the book was wrong. The book misquoted me, and I've had to, uh, you know, correct it a few times, and I wanted them to correct it, but they didn't. Uh, I don't guess it really matters which way I said it, but I, it, it matters. It mattered to me, or I, you know, I, I wouldn't have said it the way I wanted it to come out. I, what I did say is that if I don't smoke grass or if I don't get sex every day, I don't get a headache. You know, and so uh, which was trying to convey the idea that I really don't need those things. Yeah. But it came out that. If I don't get sex, or if I don't smoke grass, well, then I get a headache. You are, uh, you have very strong feelings about cocaine. Yes, I do, and I also have very strong feelings about grass. I think it's uh, it's, it's riding a lot of heat and got a lot of bad press. Uh, the greatest killer on the planet is stress. Any doctor will tell you that. The greatest medicine for stress is cannabis. Uh, and was legal up until 1937 <clears throat> when plastics and petrochemicals came out. If you'll notice, the same year they made hemp illegal was the same year that DuPont uh, received their patent to make plastics. Uh, anything now that was made from hemp is now being made from plastic. Uh, the trees that we're tearing down, uh, the, the rainforest that we're destroying is all unnecessary. Uh, one acre of hemp is equivalent to four acres of trees. So the first, you don't need, uh, you know, to, to rip up trees out of the ground to make paper. Uh, the first uh, declaration, <coughs> the first two copies of the Declaration of Independence was written on hemp paper. Uh, the first Bibles was written on hemp. The parachute that saved George Bush's life when he jumped out of a plane was made from hemp. His shoelaces was made from hemp. All of a sudden, the petrochemicals came in and took over and put hemp out of business. Uh, oil dropped down to $2 a barrel. Uh, hemp couldn't compete. So uh, cotton and other, uh, 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 you know, the first Levi's was made out of hemp. Did you know that? No. They're hard to smoke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact, uh, they won't make you high either if you smoke Levi's. It will not make you high. <clears throat> the only thing, uh, the product, uh, the only piece of that plant that they yeah. have tried to destroy and, and uh, take off the planet. Now, no one knows what happens yet when you take a plant from the planet. The hemp root has uh, 10 to 12 inches uh, uh, long. It literally holds the earth together. Now, when you take that away, the earth falls. Every civilization that's gone under in the past has gone under because of soil erosion. Mm -hmm. So now we're trying to take away the one plant that holds the planet together because the buds or the leaves will sometimes are used by some people for recreational smoking, when in actuality it's the greatest medicine on the planet. But it's being put down and being put in a category to make it illegal and dangerous simply because of big business. It's all political. You do have feelings, though, I believe, don't you, against cocaine? I am definitely against cocaine, yeah. heroin. Uh, uh, I'm against anything that goes into the human body. I don't recommend children put anything in their lungs. I, don't, I think uh, uh, anything you put into your lungs as far on is bad. Yeah. Uh, I don't recommend that. It's time to talk about women. 
I think so. I think so too. Drugs, women, yeah. Drugs, women. There are no. Isn't or maybe that it's awful, women and drugs. Isn't that an awful connection? Yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, let me see if I can rephrase that. Let's move to a higher plane and talk <laughs> about women. How's that? Well, okay. how, how many times have you been married? I don't remember. Uh, I mean, I, I say this as a, as a woman. Here's a woman who's been married four times asking mm. this question. So you don't have to apologize with me. <laughs> In that case, I've been married three times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, you just got to put it right to folks. <laughs> I mean, you, my impression, Willie, and, and we, we've never met before today, is that you like women. It's, yeah. uh, That's the reason I learned to play the guitar. Because women like men because who play women like guitar, guitar players. players. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Uh, the, the women in your life, uh, you've had some stormy relationships, and most of those I'm not going to ask about, because frankly, I think that's your own damn business. Uh, and doesn't have much place here, but there are a couple of stories that are just too good to pass up. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about, is it true that one night Martha got mad at you because you were drunk and she sewed you up in a, be a bed sheet and beat you silly? I woke up and uh, all these white things were coming at me and it was, uh, <laughs> she had done that. She had uh, meticulously sewed up this sheet around me and it uh, probably took an hour or more to do it. And then she took the broomstick and started beating me with it. One night she packed my clothes and left. <laughs> Wait a minute, she, <laughs> she took your clothes? Took my clothes and left. That's original. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of, I, I, there's something about the sewing you up, somebody up in a sheet and beating them <laughs> that I must say I find real appealing. I kind of wish, there are times I wish I'd have thought of something, <laughs> something like that. Uh, where do you get in trouble with women? What, what, what's the flashpoint? What, after a hello. I see. <laughs> Everything else is downhill from there. Now, come on now, really. What, what is it? Is it? Is it other women or is it, is it a, a I'm life? easy. <laughs> uh, no, I don't have trouble with women. I, I don't think that I have an enemy in the world that, that's uh, yeah. a, of either uh, sex, but uh, I don't think I have any uh, problems with women. Uh, I can't live with them too long at a time, and they can't live with me too long at a time, but that don't make them bad people. I, I suspect that you do get along with most every woman you meet. I do have to ask you, though, I mean, when we're talking about extraordinary stories, th they don't come much more extraordinary than the one uh, that was actually more featured in the tabloids than in the real newspapers uh, about the woman that's uh, suing for... F $50 million because she said she pro you promised to marry her, but what's more interesting is she also says that the two of you had sex for nine hours and it ended uh, with you doing a backward somersault while uh, she was still attached. Mm -hmm. Well, I am filled with awe, for one thing. Is this true? You know, some of those things they write about you <clears throat> are not true, but then some of them, they really hit it right on the head. Yeah, yeah, and if it's not true, it ought to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I'm not even sure what question to ask on that beyond what you've just said. It's such an extraordinary story. You would think at least that you'd have remembered at least, you know, some of the first hours. Uh, you would, yeah, yeah. You would have thought I would remember the first four or five hours, anyway. Uh, but you know how those nights get. <laughs> <laughs> New album, Willie Nelson, "Who'll Buy My Memories," the IRS tapes, and it's being sold through an 800 number, which we're not allowed to give out. But people can call the 800 information and get it. Now these are all your songs, aren't they, Willie? Right. Yeah. Do you have, what are your particular favorites on this album? Oh, Jimmy's Road uh, is one. Let me look at the titles there and see. There are a lot of songs on it. Oh, by my memories, it should be easier now. Will you remember her? Still can't believe you're gone. Yesterday's Wine. That's been recorded by a few people. Uh, George mm -hmm. Jones and Merle Haggard had a record out on that one. But all these are just me and my guitar. Here's uh, Pretend I Never Happened. Waylon recorded that one. Permanently Lonely, that Timmy Euro did, The Sound in Your Mind, What Can You Do to Me Now. That's a song that I wrote one night. Well, actually, me and Hank Cochran wrote that song. I think this is the only one on the album that I didn't write all of it. But it was one night in uh, Ridgetop, Tennessee. Hank Cochran and I were down in the basement. 
I'd had a, quite a year that year. I had a divorce and about three cars totaled out and uh, a lot of th various negative things had happened. So Hank and I were downstairs writing a song. So we wrote a song called What Can You Do To Me Now? And the next day my house burned down. <laughs> True story. Well, it's time to talk about the IRS and Willie Nelson. Uh, you owe them, they claim, something like 16 and 0.7 million dollars you, you were never really good with money were you Willie I, mean, I seem to be doing all right <laughs> yes well the IRS claims you are that's not where your interest is is you know strike me as a bookkeeper no uh, I I don't think I'm supposed to be one I think uh, that's why these people put those signs up and say we're professional bookkeepers and you have no business keeping your own books you should pay us to do it and then when I paid them to do it, they screwed it up. Uh, so uh, in my opinion, uh, my problem, IRS problems, uh, has nothing to do with whether I'm a good businessman or not. I just picked the wrong people to do my accounting and advising. As I understand it, um, it what happened, and I think I'm probably oversimplifying here, but. Uh, so we don't get into a detailed you know, accounting of your business, which first of all is not happened. You got some bad advice on tax shelters, uh, the, and the shelters were le then disallowed. Is that correct? Yeah. First of all, since 1982, I've paid uh, six, eight million dollars. I've paid eight million dollars in taxes since 1983. Actually, uh, up until that point is the period when all these these things happened. Uh, I owed a two million dollar bill. I was advised, now think about this, I was advised instead of borrowing two million dollars and paying my taxes, which I could have done at the time, uh, and going on about my business, I was advised to borrow twelve million dollars and get into a tax shelter that would defer those taxes till later. Uh, then what happened was this tax shelter that I was advised to get into was disallowed by the government. Uh, so that meant that all the money that I had spent on those, plus the tax shelter turned out to be a horrible idea and I lost all that money and uh, I still owe the taxes. So this is two years later, now six million dollars in taxes. Uh, it's not that easy to go borrow six million dollars in taxes, especially if you just lost 12 over here in this yeah. great deal. So uh, then what happened is the penalties and interest started accruing. Uh, now it's up to the rate of over five thousand dollars a day. Uh, I would have liked for it to have been settled five or six years ago when all these things came down, but uh, the lawyers go to school to figure out a way to stretch these things out on both sides, right? So now here it is and years later, and we're paying it for their schooling. <laughs> and uh, so here we sit years later yeah. with the uh, penalties and interest still going on, and this thing's still not settled. Willie, I want to thank you for being here both nights. It's been a real pleasure. My if pleasure. you call that 800 number to buy the IRS tapes, you will also be offered a chance to buy Willie Nelson's album, The Hungry Years. Let's hope the gentleman has no more of those. Good night.